Welcome to MTN Outdoors. Welcome everybody to MTN Outdoors. I'm your guide, Andy Curtis, and we're here inside for this week's episode at Montana Wild in Helena for two really good reasons. The first one is this is an incredible resource for anybody looking to learn more about the great outdoors here in this great state of ours. And the other reason, it's cold out, really cold out. I'm shooting this on Wednesday and I think the wind chill in Helena is like 20 below zero, 30 below zero, something like that. Uh, it's warm and heated in here, so uh, it was a no-brainer. This is as close to being outside while being inside uh, that I can find. And I think a lot of people at home can understand that because I'm guessing there's a few of you watching right now that aren't exactly crazy about this latest Arctic blast moving through the state. But the latest round of snow that we did get, especially up in the higher elevations, should help us once we get a little closer to the drier summer months. But how much is all that snow going to help us? We'll take a look at the drought conditions as we always are getting closer and closer to a dry summer coming up a little later in this episode. But first, before we get to that, the bison, a steadfast symbol of the American West and a cherished resource that we have to manage. In this first story, we'll hear from a Yellowstone biologist who says he wouldn't be surprised if a lot of these animals from the Yellowstone herd have to be removed this winter. MTN's John Shear starts things out for us. So in some years, the same individuals that will migrate all the way down to Gardner, Montana, the next year they'll stay up in the Lamar Valley the entire year. Yellowstone biologist Chris Jeremiah says there is deep snow right now with a hard crust in the northern part of the park. The harder the snow gets, the more energy it takes you know, to access grass. That means hundreds of bison are moving into the Gardner area in search of food. If you were in three to four feet of snow and you were trying to walk and every step you took, you kind of put your foot on top of the snow and then it went crashing down you know, to the bottom. It, that's an exhausting life to live. He says to expect the migration to continue until mid-March. This year, you know, we, the National Park Service, did not set a removal target. But we are going to manage the migration. There are two bison herds in Yellowstone, one in the north with about 4,500 animals and another called the Central Herd with about 1,500 animals. It occupies the interior of the park from Old Faithful all the way up to Mammoth. As bison move out of the park, there can be trouble. Buffalo on highways, buffalo on private land where people don't want them. A buffalo getting out of the conservation area and potentially transmitting brucellosis to livestock. Managing bison in Yellowstone is as much about managing people as it is about managing the animals. Every part of this program takes intense coordination with the state of Montana, with the part of USDA that manages diseases, the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, the tribes that we're working with, and the park. To keep bison from posing a problem outside the park, state hunters and tribal hunters harvest the animals. Then about 250 brucellosis-free bison are captured and are intensely tested for two years before being transferred to tribal nations to establish more bison populations. In order to get those 250 disease-free bison, about 500 must be captured. Those extra bison go to slaughter. The meat and hides are sent to Indian tribes. It really is a a day-to-day -day balancing act and we are doing everything possible to not leave anybody behind to listen to all of the different stakeholders with bison and we also ask everybody to recognize that life's always changing you know the environment's always changing things like climate change and winters like we're seeing this winter well, we're going to see a lot of buffalo down here, and we're going to do the best job we can do to manage that. Here's something else to keep in mind. Jeremiah tells me the northern part of Yellowstone can support up to 6,000 bison, while the central part of the park could support up to 5,000. That's almost double the number of bison currently living in Yellowstone. 
near Gardner in Yellowstone National Park. John Shearer, MTN News. Beatty Gulch has gotten to be, you know, a pretty hot topic. It's an area that some describe as a postage stamp, where you can see houses, Yellowstone National Park, and in the middle, Beatty Gulch, where a buffalo hunt takes place every year. But some say it's unsafe and unethical. We only authorize so many hunters. Stephanie Gillen is the Information and Education Program Manager for the Natural Resources Department of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes. They have to sign up before they even head to Gardner. Uh, there's only, you know, so many hunters through each organization allowed there. Game wardens have to be on site with them as well. They have to check in in the morning. Like, there's so much safety that goes around Beatty Gulch. Stephanie has also been a tribal wildlife biologist for just over two decades and notes the importance of the bison hunt to the tribes and to her family. Generation wise, you know, my grandmother was in her 90s when I harvested my first bison. And so I called her and I was I literally just shot my bison and, and I, you know, wanted to leave a, an offering, you know, a, to thank that bison for giving its life for for me and my family and, and asked her, you know, what should I do? And so she told me and I and I did that. Stephanie says the impact to herself and her family is huge, but she did note she has not harvested in Beatty Gulch. Coming from a tribal member hunter, uh, I've harvested two in Gardner area, but not in Beatty Gulch, I refuse to hunt there. She describes a firing line that is formed in the area. A lawyer for the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes was also on the call with me and Stephanie and said that he doesn't think the position of the CSKT is deeming the Beatty Gulch bison hunt as completely unsafe and dangerous. He says with any hunting activity, safety is important. And he and Stephanie say that organization, space and time is key. Now, hunting a bison in the Beatty Gulch area is not just for the tribes, it's for state hunters too. This season, FWP gave out 85 bison tags, 40 of which are for the Gardner area. Looking from one side of Old Yellowstone Trail south to the other, you see homes dot the landscape. One of those homes belongs to Bonnie Lynn. Even putting up my no trespassing sign, I went to hammer it in and the bullets were flying and there was one bullet that, of three bullets that came my direction and, and one killed a bison from me, maybe how many feet is that, 10 feet away, 12 feet away? But everyone asks, oh, are you against hunting? I say, no, I taught my children to hunt. I'm not against hunting, I'm not against treaty rights. What is a hunt? In Bonnie's eyes, a hunt is a fair chase and notes that the bison in the gulch are coming from the park and may not see people as a threat. She also adds that she believes the hunting that goes on here is simply not safe. Sandy Monville is a volunteer with Yellowstone Voices, an organization aimed at preserving and protecting wildlife in and around Yellowstone National Park. And the two takeaways she wants to impart? I think safety out here is, is huge. Like I said, there's been days I've come out of this house and they're shooting right there and I've been scared. I've been frightened. Um, respect for the bison. Littering the fields of Beatty Gulch, gut piles of harvested bison. Sandy sent us this photo of a bison overlooking a field. Hunting at Beatty Gulch is a large and complex issue that is hard to fit into one segment and something MTN will continue to follow. In Gardner, Jane McDonald, MTN News. So I've been called a chicken a lot by a lot of different people, but now I'm starting to think that it might be a compliment after the rising popularity of backyard poultry here in the state. In this next story, MTN's Haley Monaco catches up with a chicken connoisseur and tells you what you need to know if you want to start raising your own. The popularity of raising chickens has skyrocketed in the last few months, and I'm here at Opry Hill learning all about what it takes to raise your own. Anybody can raise chickens, literally anyone. Melissa Hyken runs Opry Hill, a small breeding facility in Laurel. Starting in 2021, she now has multiple purebred and mixed breeds that produce a plethora of egg colors. And they are quite addictive. With the price of eggs steadily rising, Hyken says many are flocking to the idea of raising their own chickens. And so the increase I've seen is people wanting eggs. But more than anything, I don't think people are worried about the cost of eggs in the store. They're worried about the limited supply. And they want a way to 
have that security. And she knows a thing or two when it comes to raising these birds. After all, she has 62 of them. First off and foremost is that these chickens, everything tries to eat them. Predators try to eat them and diseases and pests and parasites will try to eat them. Hiken does a monthly health check to make sure her coops are happy and healthy. You can do this at the cost point that you are comfortable with. She says chicken coops can range from thousands of dollars to practically free, like using an old playhouse. The goal you really would want is a draft-free coop that has proper ventilation, because that's really going to help those chickens out at all points of the year. The feed is another thing to keep in mind. Hiken feeds her birds organic feed with added supplements to stay healthy for breeding. Ours average out about $7 per bird per month. Hiken also recommends getting at least two chickens to start with and says that that some chickens will lay 250 to 300 eggs per year. If you have the desire and the want and the need, anything is possible. You can do it within your price range. You can make it affordable. You can do all of the things. In Laurel, Haley Monaco, MTN News. Well, after that story, I can understand why you might think the chicken is Montana's state bird. But after watching this, it turns out that's not the case. Which brings us to this week's MTN Outdoors trivia question. If it's not the chicken, what is the Treasure State's official state bird? Is it A, the magpie, B, the meadowlark, or C, the northern cardinal? Write down your answer, keep it secret, keep it safe, and we'll tell you what's right when we come back. We now return to MTN Outdoors. Welcome back, everybody. We're here at Montana Wild in Helena, and right before the break, I asked you this week's MTN Outdoors trivia question. And in case you missed it, or just need a few more seconds to write down your answer, here it is one more time. What is the Treasure State's official bird? Is it A, the magpie, B, the western meadowlark, C, the northern cardinal? Now this is kind of an easy one, I know but there might be someone out there who doesn't know it just yet. So if you answered B, the Meadowlark, you are 100% right. And did you know that we're not alone in celebrating that bird? Our neighbors to the south in Wyoming also have the Western Meadowlark as their state bird. So we do share more than just a national park with the Cowboy State. And I guess another thing we share with them is snow, a lot of snow. But we as Montanans don't let it slow us down. This next story is a great example of just that. I'm here at the fourth annual cross culinary event in Red Lodge, an experience that's unique to Montana, where participants can ski nearly three miles of terrain, finding local food vendors along the way. It's hard to beat a good day of cross country skiing with friends. Fresh air mixed with the beautiful scenery is part of what makes the activity so popular in Montana. Here we go. All right. I'm going to check my other one. Here at the Red Lodge Nordic Center, they've taken that experience to another level, adding fresh food to the trails. Cross country skiing is one of the best exercises there is, and so to mix it up with a little bit of really good food is a, is a nice combination. Joseph Dillard was one of the many skiers along the food path Sunday afternoon and says it was great to see the area so packed. When it's crowded, it's kind of fun because you're skiing around people and going between them, which almost never happens, and particularly up here. It's fun to see all the different variety of people that you get out on cross-country skis. And event coordinator Tom Coley says that variety is exactly what Cross Culinary aims to do. It's definitely a celebration of the area. It's, um, it brings, you know, brings some of the best culinary artists in the region to a really neat facility, the Red Lodge Nordic Center. This year's event featured food from places like Prerogative Kitchen, Samurai Sue's Everyday Foods, and Fishtail Restaurant Montasia. There was even some live music at one of the stations. Brings in about uh, 300 people and over a course of two days, and we, they ski around to different stations enjoying culinary delights. And Coley says that support is exactly what the community of Red Lodge needs after what has been an eventful couple of years. The last two years, you know, we've experienced the Robertson Draw Fire, the spring flooding. So it's a nice opportunity to come and celebrate with culinary artists and, and all the skiers. For Dillard and his friends, that's why they're here. We've been trying to come up more frequently. You know, these people are living on the edge most of the time and it's, it really hit them hard with that flooding. So we're just playing our part for the winter here. In Red Lodge, Charlie Kleps, MTN News. All that snow on the ground is great now, but will it be sticking around long enough to help us out this summer? 
MTN's Eric Johnson has a look at our drought update. On the high plains of Montana, every inch of snowfall is crucial. Really, all of the plains in the eastern part of the state are below normal for snowpack. It was a fantastic start to our snow season, but then we really dried things out during January and February. For locations east of the divide, the moisture received over the next few months will determine the outlook of the summer months, including the consequences of how that drought will affect the future of agriculture. Uh, NOAA estimates you know, across the, the plains that were four to eight inches below normal for snow depth. Wheat and barley producers have suffered major losses due to drought in 2021 and 2022, and the next couple of months will be pivotal in this summer's crop yields. The High Line continues to suffer significant year-to-year -year precipitation deficits. Uh, really, the reason that is still lingered is because of 2021, the defi deficits in precipitation that we saw, and then 2022 kind of being average to below average for, for uh, precipitation and above average for temperature. So um, the, the minor improvements we have seen along the High Line have really been due to, you know, kind of recent uh, water year moisture since the end of Oct since the beginning of October of last year. Now there is a lot to be optimistic about. The D3 extreme drought was impacting nearly 49% of Montana at this time last year. As of Thursday's drought update, less than 4% of the state remains in a D3 drought. We, we could fix it in one year uh, if we got an exceptional spring uh, or even a, a relatively normal spring uh, might, might make a huge improvement, but we're gonna need that May, June, even into early July moisture to, to really make up those, those deficits. For the last three years, the El Nino Southern Oscillation has been in its cold phase, more commonly known as La Nina. We are beginning to transition into a neutral pattern, meaning neither El Nino or La Nina is present. According to the Climate Prediction Center, there is a 60% likelihood that El Nino takes over this fall. And you know, in, you know, climatologically speaking, that does generally mean that we might see, particularly east of the divide, a drier and warmer winter for next season. Taking all of that into consideration, the effects of La Nina will still be felt as we transition into spring. There is a high probability of colder than normal temperatures. Reporting in Cascade, Eric Johnson, MTN News. And stick around, everybody, because when we come back, we're not too far removed from Valentine's Day, so we'll peek into the love life of the animal kingdom and why some last a little longer than others. There's plenty more to come here on MTN Outdoors right after this. We now return to MTN Outdoors. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for spending some time with us here this week. I can't think of a more romantic place to spend my time than right here at Montana Wild in Helena. And with love in the air, we're going to peek into the animal kingdom in this next story and answer an age-old question. Why do some animals mate for life and uh, others play the field a little bit more? MTN's Tanner Saul explains. People are quick to tie the knot, but many animals say they'd rather not. In the animal kingdom, mating for life is a rarity. Only 3% of the over 5,000 mammal species are reported to mate for life. The most commonly cited examples include beavers, wolves, gibbons, and prairie voles. But recent DNA studies have shown that even species once considered monogamous, such as wolves and gibbons, may actually have multiple partners in their lifetime. Staying faithful can be a challenge for many animals. They have biological urges to spread their genes and seek the best father for their young. And mating for life can be costly as it requires animals to put all their reproductive investment in one mate. An estimated 90% of all birds are socially monogamous, meaning they find mates to raise babies with, but still engage in the occasional fling. Take these lovebirds for example. Swans, once considered the epitome of mating for life, are actually known to cheat and abandon their mates. This raises questions about why promiscuity is tolerated despite the supposed commitment to monogamy. One theory is that females find a mate that is a good provider, but they are attracted to other males who offer superior genes or control of resources. While male animals may be promiscuous for increased reproductive success. Some scientists believe monogamy evolved in species where reproductive success is higher through pair bonding than promiscuity to allow both parents to care for their young. Black vulture parents, for instance, incubate eggs and feed their fledglings, which results in happier babies. This holds true for people too, where children take a long time to mature. 
However, some theories about the evolution of monogamy being based on fatherly caregiving are countered by the fact that males in some monogamous species don't help care for their young. Even though mating for life among wildlife is rare, there are still a few gems out there. Prairie voles are one of the few true species that provide scientists with valuable insight into the biology of mating for life. Male prairie voles will prefer to mate exclusively with the first female they mate with and will even attack other females. This behavior has been linked to certain neurotransmitters such as dopamine, which is also implicated in drug addiction in humans. The receptors are also similar to those found in people and our close relatives, bonobos, who display empathy in strong social bonds, while they are not found in less empathetic, aggressive chimpanzees. These results suggest that these receptors may impact social structure among different species and explain individual variation in attitudes towards commitment. The combination of genetic and environmental factors influence the reproductive behavior of each species, making every species that practices monogamy unique. While scientists are starting to uncover the biology behind certain animals staying loyal to their partners, the true reason for mating for life in the animal kingdom still remains mostly a mystery. In Missoula, Tanner saw MTN News. Well, that should just about do it for us here this week at MTN Outdoors. Thank you to everybody for letting me spend a little bit of time with you this week. And remember my weekly plea, send me your photos of you enjoying the great outdoors to andy.curtis at ktvh.com and you could find yourself at the end of a future episode. <sighs> And I almost didn't want to do this, but because I'm inside for this week's episode, I will make an exception for this week and this week only. If you're here at Montana Wild in Helena, take a picture and send it my way. It might be the only time and I'll accept a photo of you inside. But remember, you have to be here at Montana Wild. And that brings us to this week's MTN Outdoors Brag Board. And I want to take some time on the brag board to brag about something my wife and I did here recently. We have created a future outdoors woman and MTN outdoors viewer. Here is a picture of me and my daughter watching the Michigan State basketball game over the weekend. Sorry to brag about this. I don't want to be one of those new parents who's forcing photos of their kids on everybody. So I won't make a habit of this, at least until she starts hunting. Thanks again for watching everybody and until next week, stay safe, stay warm, and I'll see you out there.